Now, Henry Clay in his career fought a couple of armed duels. So what, what was it about his uh, service uh, in forging compromises, mm -hmm. in leading mm -hmm. uh, the House of Representatives, serving in the Senate, serving in a president's cabinet? Uh, what is it that is lacking from that service that uh, uh, we have right today? Henry was not unlike a lot of other men who felt that he had to stand up for his principles, and that's an important part of what was uh, at issue in some of those incidents. Um, but uh, it's also worth probably pointing out that Henry Clay was in many respects not quite the compromiser that we r often remember him to be. He is referred to, as you know, as the great compromiser, but he, he didn't, in fact, uh, steer the Compromise of 1820, something that sometimes is associated with him, and he didn't actually re resolve the issue of 1850 when we got to the Great Compromise of 1850. And he did but, push a president and a Congress into war in 1812. Well, that's absolutely right. And uh, it, so I think that understanding that he was a principled person who had various issues uh, that he cared deeply about uh, is an important part of putting his uh, you know, great, uh, rep uh, great reputation as a, a compromiser in perspective. Uh, compromise doesn't mean unprincipled, and often it is thought of as tantamount one to the other. Uh, he was a man who cared um, <clears throat> quite deeply about a number of political issues and wasn't at all prepared to compromise on some of those issues. This is a point that I think um, is well made by David and Jean Heidler in their uh, new uh, biography on him. Instead of referring to him as a compromiser, they refer to him as an essential American. And I think that that's uh, uh, particularly appropriate given that we Americans, of course, have principles that we won't compromise. Uh, but that said, we can't proceed without having the occasional uh, meeting in the middle ground. And uh, you know, when you think of the triumvirate that, that he was part of, that Henry Clay was part of, along with John C. Calhoun and Daniel Webster, uh, he was uh, more inclined to align himself uh, with uh, Northern interests than uh, certainly Calhoun was prepared to do, but he was always looking for ways to bring the two sides together. His principle, ultimately, was preservation of the Union. And I think it's for that reason that he was so important to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln always referred to him as the ultimate paradigm of successful political engagement. And it was out of respect for his uh, understanding that it's the union that has to come first more than anything else. That uh, Henry Clay was really part of the generation that was following the founders and trying to perfect the union. Uh, what have you found over the years in terms of the, the resonance of Henry Clay and his career uh, to people serving in the House, Senate administrations today? Well, I think that m one of the reasons that we were able to get the speakers uh, to come and join us today, and of course the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation and the Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship were critical in making all of that happen, but one of the ways that, uh, one of the reasons that we believe that those folks have, are joining us on our campus is because they recognize the truly seminal effect that Henry Clay had on the power and role of the, the speakership. To be uh, truthful, when we look at the c current political landscape, we could use for a few more Henry Clays, people who can, in fact, move the ball forward, get things done, and America seems to be craving that kind of leadership. What was the relationship between Henry Clay and Transylvania? Uh, thank you for asking. I appreciate that uh, because we're very proud of Henry Clay and Henry Clay uh, was very proud of his relationship with Transylvania. He uh, was a member of the faculty in the law department. We used to have a law school. We no longer do. But he was a very important figure in that school. He was also on the board of trustees. He was actually elected onto the board of trustees at the uh, young age of 27 and he continued to serve until his death in 1852. So he cared very deeply about this institution. Uh, he, in fact, oversaw the construction of a building that's right in the center of campus, our administration building. It's kind of a fun story, if you don't mind the aside. Um, James Morrison, when he died, left $20,000 of his uh, estate, a not insignificant amount, to Transylvania University. And when Henry Clay, who was the executor to that will, a uh, very prominent lawyer, as I'm sure you know, uh, he uh, 
in the process of diverting those funds to Transylvania was accused by Jacksonians of embezzlement. In fact, there was a journalist, one of your predecessors, a gentleman by the name of Duff Green, a Jacksonian journalist, who uh, accused uh, uh, Clay of having taken this money for his own purposes. And of course, that's not what happened. He used it for construction of Old Morrison, which is the oldest building in Lexington and part of the Lexington Seal. And uh, we have Henry Clay to thank for this grand structure because he literally oversaw the construction of the building. And I assume that the uh, legacy of Henry Clay has helped to shape the character of the kinds of students you attract here and the kinds of academic programs you it, it has. I mean, uh, Henry Clay was a very intelligent uh, and educated person who is very similar to the kinds of students that we welcome onto our campus. In fact, just earlier today, we welcomed our new uh, incoming first year class. There is one other uh, story I'd like to tell you, if you don't mind, about uh, Henry Clay on this campus. Um, he was a very successful lawyer, and in his uh, various cases as a criminal lawyer, he never lost a case. He got th to have the kind of reputation that when he was called upon by a gentleman uh, whose name was Lafayette Shelby, he was the grandson of Isaac Shelby, who had been governor of Kentucky. Lafayette was accused of drunkenly murdering uh, a gentleman right out here in the center of Gratz Park in the middle of the day. And when he needed a lawyer, he went for the best, and he got Henry Clay. And so public an issue was this case in the town of Lexington that swarms of people came from all around uh, this city, and uh, so many that they couldn't fit into the county courthouse. So they went looking for a place to have the case tried. And where did they settle? Right here on Transylvania's campus. It was the last case that Henry Clay ever tried, and it was in Old Morrison, the building that he oversaw the construction of. Wow. So, and he won his case and maintained his perfect record. So, really very exciting. What do you hope uh, to accomplish with the panel discussion that we're going to have tonight? What do you, what do you want the audience right. to take right. away from that? I'm glad you asked that question because obviously you're uh, instrumentally situated to see to it that we accomplish exactly what the goal is for this evening. I would love for us to, of course, address certain contemporary issues because the crowd will want that. But I would love even more for us to talk about the evolution of politics in this country and how they, as very prominent members of the political community in this country, understand how we have been diverted from the path that was laid by Henry Clay and his various contemporaries, where they, they looked for compromise. And it was compromise, of course, that held this nation together for its first many generations. What happened? Why are we no longer seemingly uh, capable of reaching compromise? Uh, Americans seem very frustrated by the really near bellicose discourse on the floor of Congress. And I think they'd love to see the return of the civility that was routine from Henry Clay. And so having you press them on that issue would be, I think, a great uh, uh, social service, frankly. Good goal for the evening. Dr. Williams, thanks very much. Thank you very much for being here, John. We appreciate it.